We welcome everyone today to New Hope, whether you're here, you're in the building, you're in the parking lot, you're online. We are happy that spring has arrived and warmer days are ahead. God's faithfulness, you know, is shown in the seasons. We never wonder whether the seasons are going to arrive. Sometimes we wonder when, but we always know that it's coming and it just is a sign of God's faithfulness. A uh, pastor can share details, but the meeting with the Wayne Consul and the attorney went well this week, and we should be buying the land on April the 1st, and that is not an April Fool's joke. <laughs> it is April 1st. Amen. We have finally reached the day for loading supplies for the Kentucky Mission, and we will do that right after church. It is also time for us to work at the Sharing Kitchen in Fostoria. Our dates are April 5th, 7th, and 9th. If you are new at New Hope, we serve food to the needy in Fostoria every three months. Now, not that they would only serve food every three months. We just go every three months. We arrive about 845, and serving begins at 9. And all you have to do is serve food, as long as your arm and you can stand on your legs, you can do this job. Those are your job requirements. We arrive and it is easy, it takes no technical skills, you just need to serve the food. We're usually done around 10.30. The address is on your handout and we also have a sign-up sheet at the information table. Sometimes people don't always know if they're going to be able to go a certain day. So, you know, if you decide at the last minute that you can go, just call Pastor Ron because he just appreciates knowing if we have en enough workers. And likewise, if you can't go, we appreciate you letting him know that also. I wanted to report to you that Ron and Edith Labory, <coughs> who were at the Briar Hill Nursing Home in North Baltimore, can now have visitors. This is the first time that we can visit them in their room. It's been a whole year. So it opened up on Friday and we went Friday afternoon. We thought we better get right in there before everybody's trying to go see them because they do have lots of friends. They only do allow two at a time. So if you would like to visit, it's now open and you can go see them. And I know they would appreciate a visit. I think that takes care of our announcements today so the nursery and kids church children can line up at the back door and a teacher will take you over. Thank you. So today we're going to share a little bit. You know, on Jesus on his way to the cross had an evening where he spent with his disciples. And I was thinking about that, what it would be like or what, what would go through my mind if I was spending an evening with somebody and I knew it was the last, the last meal. And, you know, you might sit and reminisce or you might talk about a lot of different things. But it's interesting to me that Jesus, what he did was he taught his disciples. You know, he took that moment to, to teach them something. And we're going to look at that today. It's in John, the 13th chapter. We're going to begin at the second verse. And supper ended. The devil already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray Jesus. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, he rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus said to him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. And Peter said to him, well, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, if I do not wash you, you, are no, you have no part of me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher, the Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. 
For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. If you do them. So what Jesus did was he showed by example. He showed by example to his disciples what it meant to serve and who should serve. And I believe he, he saw that this was, was really important for what they were going to be called to. And I believe he also knew the disciples' hearts. And I want to look at that for just a minute to see, well, where are they coming from in this whole process? Did they really, did they really understand? We see in Luke 22, verse 24, It says, now there was a great dispute among them. So the disciples, you know, right, right before this, they're, they're arguing. And they're saying, well, who's the greatest? They're disputing about who's the greatest among them. And Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. But as, but you are those who have continued with me in my trials. And I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on the thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Where do the disciples come from? They didn't understand. They were arguing who's the greatest. You know, they're still they're still arguing this this point of, well, who's the greatest among us? You know, the world says whoever's greatest is the one that sits at the table. And Jesus says, Well, I come to you as one who serves. And then in Matthew the twentieth chapter, beginning at the twentieth verse. The mother, of Zebed, the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, What do you wish? And she said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You don't know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am about to be baptized with? And they said to him, Oh, we're able. And he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and to sit on my left is not mine to give, but is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. And then when the twelve heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two. And Jesus called them to himself and said, You know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, that those who, those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet, I, yet it shall not be among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did, not come in to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So what we see is the disciples, and you know, we had a mother, a mother who even brings her two sons to Jesus, says, hey, when, when you get this kingdom set up, can my, can my son sit in a place of importance? And you can see where these disciples and the people are coming from and how they perceive importance. And who's important? And they're all kind of jockeying for position. And so Jesus, I believe, he sees all this and he says, you know, I need to, I need to show them. I need, I need to set an example for them. In Matthew, he says, whoever wants to be first, let him serve. That is so contrary to our worldly understanding that is complete opposite opposite of what the world says the servant is never greater than the master so what we see here is jesus he says well my kingdom's different my kingdom's different it's different when you follow me and so he shows them this by saying you know i'm your i'm your master and i'm going to wash your feet back in john 13 and verse 6 it says he came to Simon Peter. And Peter says, Lord, why are you washing my feet? Simon Peter, I think, you know, it appears to me, Simon Peter had a lot of pride. He had a lot of pride. And he's going, Lord, why are you washing my feet? You know, 
What, what are you doing? Didn't understand. He didn't understand. And in verse 7, Jesus says, well, what I'm doing, you don't understand, Peter. This is contrary to your thinking. Do you know that the things that God asks us to do a lot of times are contrary to our thinking? You know, the Bible says, my thoughts aren't your thoughts. And my ways are not your ways. Mine are higher. And it's, it's, that's a real difficult thing sometimes for us to get into our heads and through our heads. That God has a different way. God has a different way. God's ways are different. It's not the ways of the world. And so Peter says, well, Lord, you, you, sh you should never wash my feet. You, 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 this isn't right. You shouldn't wash my feet. And then Peter says, well, actually, if you're going to do it, he says, well, then don't do just my feet. Do all of it. So he, he still doesn't get it. He still doesn't get it. And Jesus says, well, if you don't let me wash your feet, I have nothing to do with you. Jesus is setting an example. He's setting an example. The Bible says that we are to be one in Christ. I believe if we're one in Christ, serving is not an option. It's not an option. Jesus didn't, he didn't say, well, you know, if you, if you follow me, you can serve if you feel like it. Or if you follow me, you can serve if it works out. Or if you happen across an opportunity to serve, take it. He says, you're called to serve. And he says, you're not greater. You're not greater than me. And so Jesus set an example for us and for his disciples. The master washed the disciples' feet. And you know, we're not, we're not greater than him. We're called to do what he's called us to do. We're called to serve. There's a verse that says, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, if you want to be great, you've got to be the servant of all. That is so contrary to what we see all around us. Completely contrary to what the world says. Completely contrary. So why don't we serve? What keeps people from serving? If, if you know, Jesus says, you know, you need to do this, and if you're going to follow me, you need to be a servant, what keeps us from doing that? So I thought about that. What keeps us? I thought about a few things. Number one, selfishness and self-centeredness. If all you think about is you, you're probably not going to serve. I don't know if you've watched social media much. It seems to me in general, in general, I'm not being specific about everything, but in general, social media is completely selfish. I'm amazed. I'm amazed. What do people take? They take selfies. They take selfies. What's that? Uh, you know, so you can see me. I'm not saying, you know, it's wrong to put your picture on there, but I'm just saying, think about it. Think about it. What's, what's projected? Well, it's all about me. It's all self-centered. A lot of times I believe people think about, well, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? What am I going to get out of this? If I think what's in it for me, you're probably not going to serve. Because when you serve, you think about the other person. And sometimes there's nothing in it for you. You know, it's not about you. It's not about you. A lot of times people think about getting ahead. Well, what is it out there? What's, what is it out there? It's dog eat dog. You know, it's a tough world. You know, you go out there and if you, you act like a servant, people are going to run all over you. People are going to take advantage of you. Absolutely true. Just so you know. Just so you know, yes, they will. They will take advantage of you. Jesus said, he said, you know, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. You got to be willing to lay down your life. Sometimes we think it's all about recognition. You know, who gets recognized? When's the last time you saw a big trophy given out for a servant? 
You know, when's the last time we really recognized a servant? I'm not saying it never happens. I'm not saying it never happens. But I'm just saying that's not our normal thinking. That's not our normal thinking that we recognize people who serve. Sometimes it, it maybe depends on what group you're in. You know, if you're in a service group, sometimes that's, they know that's what they do. But by and large, you know, companies, businesses, they don't give out too many recognitions for the greatest servant in their company. A lot of times we see that as weakness. We see it as weakness. We recognize people who succeed. We recognize people who attain positions. We hold, we hold people up that obtain positions. Wow, look, they're succeeding. They, they have a position. And we honor that. And I'm not saying it's wrong to honor that. I'm just not sure it's biblical. What did Jesus say? He says, well, you know, the world recognizes position. The world recognizes that, and they hold that up. He says, well, that's not the way it is in my kingdom. If you want to be great, you become the servant. So I believe the whole idea of being a servant works against our thinking. Works against our thinking. In Matthew, the 16th chapter, the 24th verse, It says, Jesus said to his disciples, if you desire to come after me, if you desire to follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life is going to lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So Jesus kind of lays it out. He says, you know, if you want to follow me, you got to deny yourself. Selfishness doesn't work. You got to deny yourself. You know, sometimes I have to deny what I think. I have to deny my opinions. You know, I have to I have to sometimes give up that. I have to give that up. I'm not saying you can't have an opinion, but sometimes you got to give them up. Sometimes you got to just keep them to yourself. You know, I think there's a lot of times when you can have an opinion, but it's better kept to yourself. I've also found that sometimes when people ask me for my opinion, it's better kept to yourself. It's almost like bait. It's almost like bait. Like, come on, tell me what you think. And you do, and then bam. All of a sudden, oh, man, I shouldn't have said that. You know? Because a lot of times people don't want your opinion. I've come to that conclusion, too. They want agreement. Agreement. Agreement is different than an opinion. Okay. But Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to follow me, he says, you've got to deny yourself. It's not about you. It's not about you. Boy, that's a tough one. I thought it was all about me. You know? I thought it was about how I feel. I thought it was about if I'm happy. Does this make me happy? I'll do this. I'll do this if it's convenient. I'll do this if it works, if it makes me happy. I'll do it if there's something in it for me. I'll do it if people treat me nice. You know, sometimes we'll serve only if people will treat us nice. Well, they ought to at least say thank you. There's nothing in here that says they have to say thank you. It says you serve. I don't doesn't matter if they say thank you or not. You know, it's nice when they do. And if you're being served, please say thank you. <laughs> you know? But it's not a criteria for why I serve. I don't serve for recognition. I don't serve for a thank you. I don't serve to be held in some kind of a place of esteem. We're called to serve. Take up your cross and follow me. You know, it's, it's not... It's not put out there like it's a real easy path. There's nothing, there's nothing about that scripture that says, wow, this is going to be easy. As a matter of fact, Jesus says, what good is it for you if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? You can gain everything. You could have prominence, recognition. You can be successful. People think you're the greatest person in the world. 
You can gain it all. But what good is it if you lose your soul? You know, I believe compared to eternity, a lot of things are pretty worthless. A lot of things are pretty worthless. If we really, if we really think about it, if we really think about what's going on. We have to lay down my desires, my wants. I have to see others. Now, that's one of the things I think, if, if you're selfish, you only see what you want to see. I only see how this affects me. Think about going through life and saying, wow, I wonder how this is going to affect the other person. I wonder, wonder how they feel. What could I do to help them? How, how would this make them feel? How could, I, how could I serve somebody? It's a whole different attitude. It's a whole different, it's a whole different way of looking at life. And I believe we're called to serve. We're called to see life that way. We have to be willing. I believe that sometimes we don't serve because the love of Christ isn't in us. That sounds, that sounds kind of, I know it sounds a little harsh maybe, but in 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, the 14th verse, it says, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge up. We judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. He died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. It says, the love of Christ compels us. When the love of Christ is in us, I believe it compels us. It compels us. It drives us. It should motivate us. It should be something inside of us that says, you need to serve. Now, we may be growing in that. We may be learning. We may be at some point of starting. But I believe in the love of Christ is in us. If Christ is in me and he came to serve, wouldn't that, wouldn't that thing inside of me want to serve? Wouldn't Jesus in me want to serve? Well, yes, he does. And what's he going to do? He's going to do it through me. So that love of Christ that's in me should compel me to serve. Compel me to want to help others. Compel me to see others where they're at and what they're going through. It should compel us. Now, I believe it works against our flesh. You know, there's a part of me. We all got a flesh. You know, the Bible says we need to, what to our flesh? We need to crucify our flesh. Why? Because it's nasty. It's nasty. My flesh, that part of me, my, my sinful nature, that part of me that says, well, I'm not going to do that. They don't deserve that. My flesh will tell me that people don't deserve things. Then I re have to remind myself, what do I deserve? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us, so what do I deserve? Or sometimes I think, well, I loved somebody once and I served them. And they treated me bad. That's it. I'm not, I'm not doing that again. I'm not doing that again. I'm here to tell you, they will do things that aren't nice to you. Accept it. Know it's going to happen. The love of Christ compels us to serve. Not based upon the results. Not based upon the does not say you can you have to love people and serve them if they're nice to you or if they do something for you. You know, we do it because the love of Christ dwells in us. The love of Christ. He died for me, so now I need to live for others. It's not about me. It's not about me. I hear people a lot of times nowadays say, well, I'm just not happy. I'm just not happy. Well, you know what? Sometimes you're just not happy. You know? It's, sometimes that's just the way it is. It's, it's not, you know, it's not always. Jesus said, follow me, deny yourself, take up a cross. He didn't say, oh, and be happy. Now, I can have the joy of the Lord. I can have the joy of the Lord. I believe we always, that's always there. It doesn't mean I'm happy. And God does you know, I just want you to know, and I don't, I don't mean this to sound harsh, but I don't think God's too worried about whether or not I'm happy. <laughs> you 
you know i don't know i don't i don't see anywhere in scripture you know look at the early disciples they followed him what happened to them you know they stoned thrown in prison all kind of bad things happened to them i don't know you know one thing i do know that paul and silas while they were in jail they were still singing praise the lord so you know sometimes you know I, i'm not saying they were happy but you know they still had the joy of the lord god still used them god still used them put them in jail to use them yeah i don't like thinking about that <laughs> but you know it's it's reality it's not always about being happy so when we know Christ and Christ dwells in us, I believe that love compels us. I believe it fights with my flesh. That part of me that says, I don't want to do that. That part of me that says, I don't have time to do that. The part of me that says, it's not going to work. The part of me that says, well, I don't know. It just, just seems like a waste of time. Sometimes you think it's a waste of time. There's that part of me. That part of me. So we crucify, crucify our flesh. Crucify that part. We need to put that part of us down and say, okay, the love of Christ compels me. The love of Christ compels me. I know, I know. Sometimes you just know what it is God wants you to do and you know you don't want to. You ever had that? You know what God wants you to do and you don't want to. I recently had that. I knew what God wanted me to do and I struggled. I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't want to, I don't. No, you know, but I was com uh, uh, compelled, you know, because I knew, I knew, I knew what it was God wanted me to do. Okay, I'll do it, I'll do it. Irregardless, irregardless of what happens, we're compelled. We're compelled to love, we're compelled to serve. In James, the second chapter, the 14th verse, it says, what is a prophet, my brother, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? You know, we can go around and say, oh, I have faith. I believe in God. I, I, I believe in God. Well, if you believe in God, you're going to do the works of God. You, you, you know, I think we try to separate that. We try to separate. We just say, well, I have faith. I, yeah, I believe God. Well, then what are you doing? It says, if you have faith, you have works. Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one says to them, depart in peace and be warmed and filled. God bless you. Have a great day. You know, it's, what, it's a, you know, kind of a nice gesture. It says, but you do not give them the things they need for the body. What does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Faith without works is dead. You can say you have faith, but it will produce works in you. You will be compelled to do the work of God. Faith without works is dead. It's not faith. Now, it doesn't say how much. You know, it's not a quantity thing. It's just saying that if you have faith, you're going to do what God says. That's going to be your desire. That's going to be what you want to do. I want to do what God wants me to do. That's different than what I want to do. Just so you know. What you want to do, what God wants to do, are two different things normally. Very seldom, very, very seldom does my flesh want to do what God wants to do. I'm not saying it can't happen. But most of the time, when God asks me to do something, my first reaction is, Oh, no. I don't think so. I don't think so. Or, oh, no, that won't work. That won't work. Oh, no. Those people, if I do that, what's going to be their reaction? How are they going to respond? What are they going to do? What are they going to say? Oh, no, I can't do that. And then if we listen and if god is in us what happens pretty soon something starts to stir in you and all of a sudden it doesn't go away oh man i thought that thought would just go away i always say if it doesn't go away it's probably god because god god doesn't give up 
So, you know, he'll say, you know, do this. And I'll, okay, well, you know. And then pretty soon it's like, oh, man. It just kind of keeps working in me. That's the Holy Spirit. He just kind of keeps prodding you. You know, because my flesh isn't always as cooperative as it ought to be. And so he prods me. You know, you need to do this. Did you ever think, I need to go see somebody. I need to do this for somebody. And then you kind of go, oh, no. And then pretty soon it's like, oh, man. It doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. You know, I need to do that. And then you, well, but pretty soon you go, okay, I need to just do this. You know, I believe sometimes that's how God works. Why? Because my flesh is still alive and well. You know, and my flesh doesn't always want to do what God calls me to do. And sometimes he asks us to do things that maybe we don't feel qualified for. You know, I, I remember a long, long time ago, somebody said, God doesn't, work, God doesn't worry about our ability. He works about, worries about our availability. <laughs> he'll take care of the ability. He said he'll provide whatever we need. He'll, he'll give us the ability. Now, see, I always look at it and go, Lord, I can't do that. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know. Isn't that what the disciples said? Well, what are we going to say when we get there? Jesus says, well, don't worry about it. I'll give you the words when you get there. You know, I'm always like, well, what's going to happen if? What about, what about this? What about that? What about this? And so I get to the point where I say, okay, Lord, because the love of Christ compels us, compels us. I would encourage you, don't make this difficult. I believe we're called to serve. We should look for opportunities to serve. I believe the opportunities are usually around us. I believe they're very much natural. I believe they're simple a lot of times. Um, a lot of times they can be easily overlooked. We can almost skip over them if we're not paying attention. But I believe since we're called to serve, God will give us opportunities to serve. He'll give us opportunities. Because that's what he calls us to do. The love of Christ in us compels us. If you want to be great in his kingdom, be the servant of all. Be the servant of all. Don't look for position. Don't look for recognition. Look for opportunity. Opportunity. Opportunities to serve. I believe as a church, as a church, I believe that's one of the things we need to always kind of keep in front of us. God, give us opportunities to serve. How do you want us to serve? It can be individually you know, God calls us individually to serve in areas where nobody else can go or nobody else has opportunity. Sometimes he calls us to serve as a group. I believe going on the mission to Kentucky is a, is a group opportunity to serve. You know, God's, God's called us, you know, we're able to serve. We're able to give. And so we have opportunities. We have opportunities at church. I think, I think when a church becomes inward, it's the death of the church. I believe when we quit seeing the world around us. You know, I believe one of the reasons we serve is so Christ can be shown to people. They can actually experience him. They can experience him in a real tangible way. You know, and it gives us opportunity maybe to share, to share a gospel, to share a word with somebody. But it gives us opportunity to be what God's called us to be. So I pray, I pray that you just be sensitive. Watch for opportunities to serve. If, if we're called to serve, I know God has a lot of ways for us to serve. If we just open our eyes a lot of times and see what's going on around us. Let's all stand. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, that, that uh, you came and you set an example for us. Lord, you serve, you gave your life. You paid the ultimate price by giving your life on the cross. And so, Lord, as we follow you, we're called to serve. Lord, help us to see, help us to have eyes, help us to open our eyes. Lord, help us to get our focus off of ourselves. Lord, that we can see others and see their needs in ways we can serve. Lord, we thank you for that. Thank you for your love for us. 
Lord, I just pray that you would uh, be with those that are going to Kentucky. Lord, just watch over them. Bless them as they take this, this food and these uh, items down to Kentucky. Lord, we thank you for your presence with us. Lord, just uh, be with us in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, Amen.